water commissioner, and I am responsible for all of the water systems, water and sewer systems we have. So here's the map of the entire water system in COVID. So we have six wells that feed our water supply, and each well is capable of producing about seven to 1,200 gallons per minute. Uh, we feed about 29 miles of pipe throughout our system, and we also have a water tower that holds 500,000 gallons and it helps maintain our pressure throughout our system. The water tower acts like an expansion tank and allows us to use water without turning on a well every time we need a drink. We test our water on a weekly basis and submit those samples to the state. We have very strict limitations on any contaminants. Every year we have to publish the results of all our tests for the entire year. And last year's results were published in the COZAD local on 6 of 23. You can obtain a copy at our office. So here's what the samples are that we submit to the state. And it uh, uh, reads a lot, but I send a, a sheet with it that looks like this that explains all of the samples, all of the numbers and letters. So, uh, the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy and Drinking Water Division mandates that we have licenses to work and operate on our water system. Um, there are four levels of licensure. Uh, grade four is the entry level. Uh, grade three is more advanced and deals with operations. Uh, grade two is lab testing. And grade one is water treatment. Uh, since we do not treat our drinking water, we are required to have a grade three license to operate our system. We currently have two grade threes and one grade four operator license. Jerry, is that, Jerry, <laughs> we're just talking about Jerry. Troy, is that because you need more help or is that kind of an average? Of Ideally, we would have everybody certified to at least the entry level and we're working on it, but the classes with the COVID and everything have really been sporadic and spaced out and they fill up so quick. So they're already full until March next year. How many people do you still have to certify? Four. Four. Yeah, we have six total that work for us. So. And what are you certified at? Three. Three. Um, my question is on that sheet prior to this one, it's always disconcerting to me that I see arsenic is the first one. Yes. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about those chemicals and so all of those chemicals um, are erosion from natural deposits. So those are those are common in the in the ground all the time. Um, if you drill a well, you'd have the same issues. So they have what they call action levels and um, maximum contaminant levels. So the ACL and the AL. Those are the le levels that they say you have to stay below before you have any health risks. And if you look at our results, we're under on all of those. So for our stick, for instance, our value um, was 6.65, was the highest value for the entire year. And the maximum contaminant level is 10 parts per billion. So that's micrograms per liter. And then and I've always heard that COZET has a high water table. That is correct. Well, what does that mean? That means the natural level of the water in Cozad is very, very shallow. So depending on the year, um, you can dig a hole three foot deep and hit groundwater. Now that's not the water that we drink. Our wells go way deeper than that, about oh, two to 400 feet. So are we in the Ogallala Aquifer? Is that yeah, where our right wells? Top of the Ogallala Aquifer. So is that where the wells hit yes. then? Okay. That is where our water comes. Okay, let's talk about our water system. And this is kind of an outline of our, a rough outline of what our system looks like. When we use the water, it comes out of the water tower and it slowly lowers the level in the tower. We have sensors to tell us how full the tower is. These sensors automatically turn on the wells according to the level in the tower and the tower, and the lower the level in the tower, the more wells that get turned on. Uh, this all happens at exactly the same time, kind of like this. Okay. 
That's kind of how it operates. It's pretty clever. Did you make that? I did. That's pretty awesome. Um, along with this, there's always going to be pressure fluctuations in the system. Uh, there's nothing we can do about those, but this water tower and this system helps minimize those pressure fluctuations. Uh, we're at a possible place. Another way to help minimize pressure reduction is to alternate demand. Uh, uh, example, most people that have automatic sprinklers uh, water every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And this leads to a very high demand on our system, about a million gallons more every Monday and Wednesday and Friday. If half the people would water on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, it would balance out our load and it would help maintain our pressure throughout the whole town. So that's one way to minimize pressure. And you had asked for, the water department had asked for this year for even house numbers to water on Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and odd house numbers to water on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And so that would, that's kind of what this is talking about. So you'd like to get that word out. Just to minimize our, our pressure fluctuation and help with our demand throughout the whole system. So if we could just up our demand for 500,000 gallons throughout the whole week and rather than a big roller coaster, it would really help with the, the main pressures. And we're about to talk about the pressures in the water mains. Um, it has a lot to do with water main, why water mains break, the pressure. Ideally, the pressure inside the main stays consistent. Um, but as we discussed, that's not always the case. Um, the pressure outside the main, out of the ground, is always pushing or pulling on the pipe. Uh, when the ground warms up, it, it pulls or relaxes its pressure. When it gets cold, it pushes or squeezes on the pipe. When the main break is usually because the pressure inside the main is lower than the outside pressure. Uh, main breaks, this is just one cause for main breaks. There are many contributing factors like age and material, even location. But pressure is the one that we focus on because it's the one we have the most control over. Okay. How, how many main breaks would you say? Say you guys have fixed in the last year, or I, or, or or you know what's an average? How many main breaks do you have in an average it, year? It's hard. It's hard to say over the entire year, but last January we fixed six. Um, was that due pretty much to the temperature? Do you think? It had to do a lot with the temperature and the pressure fluctuations. Yeah, due to the temperature. Right. Uh, now we're going to discuss backflow prevention. Backflow prevention is one of the most important yet misunderstood aspects of the water industry. The basics of backflow are very simple to understand. It's to stop something outside the system from getting inside the system. That's it. If we don't, we can end up like Corpus Christi, Texas, where utility crews pinpointed a source of E. coli contamination in the water due to a absent backflow prevention device on a sprinkler system. So Corpus Christi is a really big town, so it took a lot of uh, investigation to get there. So there are a lot of people that got sick because of it. But it always doesn't happen in the bigger cities. In a small village in Louisiana, population 94, uh, they had to boil their water because the homeowner installed a water softener and didn't install the proper backflow. So it allowed chemicals to get into their water supply. So it happens anywhere at any time. So it gets kind of confusing when we stop when we start talking about how to stop the water from coming back into the supply. The state water drinking division, state drinking water division, managed that uh, what type of backflow we use and in what kind of situations we use them. Uh, we have to take a class, so we have to be certified and take tests in order to determine which one you need and in what situation. Uh, we currently have three people certified in backflow prevention. It's called a grade six. Backflow prevention can be as simple as pulling your hose out of the pool when you're filling it, so it's not in the water. That's called an air gap. An air gap is the space 
between um, the hose or the water faucet and the pool water. Backflow prevention can also be extremely complicated enough to require an engineer to design. I'm going to show you some pictures of some more common backflow prevention devices. Um, this is an integral hose bib vacuum breaker. It's built into the faucet. These are very common in newer construction, say 1990s. If you don't have one that looks like this, then you should be putting one of these it does the same thing, but it attaches to the threads. And what does that do? That's the same thing as a vacuum breaker. It keeps water from going backwards. So instead of going back into your house, it will shoot out those little holes. Uh, especially if you're using uh, yeah, fertilizers or weed killers that hook to your hose. If we were to have a main break or a large fire, there's a potential we could suck that back into your house. So like for the library on our outdoor faucets, we should have something like you that. Have those, yes, yes. And how much are something like that? I'm sorry, I don't know what they cost nowadays. I know what they used to cost. I used to buy them for three dollars, but nothing costs three dollars anymore. <laughs> but you can get them at any plumber store or even the hardware stores carry them. They're very common. This one we should all recognize it's on most automatic sprinkler systems. Uh, Anybody with an automatic sprinkler has one of those, should have one of those on the outside of their house. It's called a pressure vacuum breaker. And this one is called a reduced pressure backflow device. It's mostly used for higher hazard locations, such as chemical plants, restaurants, some of those places. Um, are these things, Troy, like if you're having, say, like a, a toll issue or a suit? I mean, the plumbers should know about these. Are, are yes. plumbers um, certified like you were just talking about? It's very difficult to determine who is and who isn't. The state has a list. Uh, they have on their website who is certified and who isn't. But plumbers should have a real good idea about back Plumbers should have a really good idea about when you need one, but... I would suggest if you question it, call my office. We'll set up a time to come out and do an inspection. We can't put them in for you, but we can tell you whether you need one or not, whether you should have one or whether it's just something you're just going to have to be careful of. That's good to know. Is is that a cost at all to the citizens? No. That kind of leads me into the next one. We send out cards every five years. This is required by the state. And I send these out to everybody. This helps us identify any potential problems and uh, find solutions before it occurs. Um, this is what the cards look like, and the questions help us determine if and or what kind of backflow device should be used. Um, some of these questions are misunderstood. I was so going to say, I always think that you need a, what is this column? <laughs> so, so you I can would like to explain some of the common <laughs> misunderstood questions. Um, boiler heat or water-to-air heat pump. Uh, this refers to a hot water heating system or a water source heat pump. It does, water heater does not count as a boiler for these, this purpose. Uh, swimming pool or hot tub. This only refers to swimming pools or hot tubs if they're permanently connected to the water supply. However, I highly recommend that if you fill a swimming pool or a hot tub from a hose, that you use one of those hose bed vacuum breakers. Um, I could discuss backflow for hours, so I'll just cut it off here. But if you have any questions, please call my office. If, if you were to have a backflow issue at a private well in the country, could that affect the city in any way? No, but it would affect your house. So it would affect you and your family. So there again, um, I can't have my guys go out and inspect it, but I could, you could call a plumber to have out and come inspect your house for any potential problems. Cross-contamination is what they call it. All right, moving on. This picture shows the average service line. The part that is to the left of the property line or the curb stop is the city service line. It is the city's responsibility to make 
The right side of the curb stop or the property line is the homeowner's responsibility. I get a lot of phone calls on this about where the, the responsibility stops. And it's right there at that curb stop is where the responsibility changes hands. So when there's new construction, the city would, would put in so much up to... We put in the piece to the right side of this. To the left side. To the left side of this, yes. Sorry. Okay, in that, uh, in that line of thinking, we need to discuss lead pipes. Lead pipes have been in the news a lot lately, and I want to inform everyone what that means for us. Lead lines were used from the 1930s all the way up until the late 1970s in the water industry because it was cheap, durable, and could be molded to any shape. The problem was it is toxic in relatively small quantities. There have been many studies on lead, and what they have found is that when it's used for water pipe, the pipe forms a scale on the inside that sort of insulates the water from the lead. The lead leaching into the water is greatly reduced when this happens. What that means is that unless someone is disturbing a lead water line, there is very small risk of lead leaching into the water supply. We still test for lead according to the state regulations and publish those results as well. But if you are concerned, you can contact a lab and they could send you a home sample kit or you could run about two gallons, that's about one minute, of water before you drink it. The water department has had the policy that we do not repair lead lines. If one has a leak, we will replace it. The EPA has mandated that we develop a lead service line inventory. This means that we have to determine what every service line is made of. We will eventually have to develop a plan to replace all the lead service lines in town. Any questions? How many are you been finding so far? I haven't tallied the numbers, but um, it's substantial. Well, you said this was used often through the 70s, right? And the bulk of COZAD's houses was before that with That's Tenneco, correct. Monroe. That's correct. So most there are older many. houses, and that's many, would probably have the lead yes. pipes. And it doesn't have to be the entire thing. It could be <laughs> part of it. You know, um, the city's part could be lead or the homeowner's part could be lead, but they don't both have to be lead. When you're finding lead pipes for the city, do you contact the homeowners to let them know we that that they can that so they should be checking theirs? Unless they we find lead lines from our curb stop into the house, we just change out our side of it because if it's copper or plastic or any of these other pipes, <laughs> it, it's not gonna affect them and it's a huge expense that they would need to spend. Right, but if you see that there's lead, do you let them know? Yes, we do. Okay. Roughly, how much do you think it's going to cost to change out all the lead pipes? For the city? Yeah. Rough numbers is about $2,000 per. Per lead pipe? That's okay. each. And that's just our portion. Okay. I really couldn't speculate on what it would cost the homeowner. You'd have to do that on the private homeowner. So you said the EPA has gotten involved in this. Are there going to be some They're, grants or anything like that? They are not talking about any grants or any kind of funding at all. Um, they're actually in the process every year of updating this, and they've been in that process for the last three years. So eventually they're going to come out with this rule. Uh, I don't know what they're going to mandate and what they're not going to mandate, but nobody's talking about any funding whatsoever. So it would be a huge expense either way, but it would be a huge expense for every town in America. Not well, that's kind of what I was thinking because they, they had that big infrastructure. So I was wondering if this was a part of the infrastructure. No. It is not. This is separate from that. We have been and are in the process of all the water meters in town. The water meters are like any other mechanical device. They wear out over time. These new water meters have no moving parts, 
and can be read with a radio device. So no more meter readers walking around town once a month. The meter replacement should not take very long, about 15 to 20 minutes. We will need to shut off the water during this time and we do require somebody to be home. Uh, the water department is doing sections of town at a time. So if we haven't been to your house yet, we will get there. Just be patient with us, please. Um, we are hanging notification on your doors when we are in your neighborhood. So when you get the notification, please call my office and set up a time that will work for you. Where are you right now at that point? Uh, West 13th is where we're working on now. And are you working north. north to south? North to south. So we'll get there, just give us some time. The water operators they, that we do have require a lot of knowledge hill. Uh, uh, just to keep the water going as normal, it takes an awful lot to do that. So uh, I just want everybody to be patient and understand we're doing the best we can. That's about it for the water side. Let's talk about the sewer side. Our sanitary sewer system is made up of a series of 29 miles of pipe, over 300 manholes, and four lift stations. All of this dumps into a water resource recovery facility that can treat up to 1 million gallons of wastewater a day. The whole new meaning of your fullest. The fact that you made all of these brown. <laughs> where the water lines were all blue. Not, that not my <laughs> what is what's going along I eighty that's all brown, or is that? That's just the road. That's just I eighty. Okay. That's, not... like, ah, that's a really big line. <laughs> yeah. We do have another cross on I eighty. It's twenty four inch, but that's our discharge for our wastewater recovery facility. The sewer system in that is what we call a gravity system, meaning it drains with gravity. And gravity works really well if you're going short distances. But ours has to drain for two miles. If we start on the north end all the way to the treatment plant, it has to drain for two miles. The problem is it gets too deep going that far, so we have to install lift stations. Lift stations are a really big sump pump. Their structures built to lift the wastewater to a higher elevation by using the pumps. The incoming waste, the influent, drains into a big tank called a wet well, and then it's pumped into a pipe that is higher so it can gravity drain further. All of our manholes are sanitary sewer. Some of our manholes are telephone and some are storm sewer. You should never open or go into a manhole for any reason unless you are trained and authorized. It is extremely dangerous. We have manholes all along our sewer system. These are used to make junctions and to give us access to the pipes. The problem is they're starting to fall apart. So because of this, we have started a manhole rehab program. They have many ways of doing this, but one of the ones we use most often is called slinging. This is when they drop a device down the manhole and pump a special concrete mixture through a tube, and this device spins around and slings the concrete around the manhole, and they are able to get a consistent thickness and coverage this way. Most of the sewer mains are made up of a material called vitrified clay pipe. This pipe is a brick-like material that is very strong, but it is extremely brittle. This pipe has outlived its life expectancy, meaning they didn't think it would last this long. We have replaced some of this pipe, but it's very costly and time-consuming to replace. But we do maintenance daily. This is what some of our pipe looks like. This is a piece that we found and we have fixed and replaced it. So is that where you're talking about slinging? It slings the... No, this is the pipe. This is something this different. Is I do okay. see pictures of a manhole. You really don't want to see it. 
This you just need to this replace. Just to show you what some of our two remaining look like. But you need to replace those. We can do several things, and I'll get to that in just a second. We have a company that comes in once a year to inspect our sewer system with a video camera, which is what you see here. This way we can see which portion of our system is needed is in need of repair the worst. And we have started a new system of repair called Lime. This is when they shove a resin soaked resin soaked sock inside of the pipe and they inflate the steam. The sock forms in the diameter of the pipe and then turns hard like PVC, but the resin fills in all the cracks and the voids and makes the old pipe twice as strong as it was to begin with. And they guarantee this pipe for 100 years. I don't have any pictures of that because I don't pay them to go back and video it after they repair it. <laughs> so what's the cost of something like that then? Uh, for the lining, I think they quoted me $29 a foot for the lining and then there's mobilization fees and that. We have an annual budget of about fifty to sixty thousand dollars, depending on what we see. So every year they come and, and video part of the town, and then we review those videotapes and determine which part of town we need to line, which ones we don't, which ones we can put up another year, or which ones need more attention. So if you were a guesstimating person, since they're supposed to be good for a hundred years, then how many years of this do we have to look forward to? We won't get done in my lifetime. Okay. This, this will be an annual thing for the foreseeable future. Um, simply because we have other budgetary concerns that come up and we might not need have the money to do it every year. So some years we might not get any, and some years we might do a bunch. Last year we did a little over 3,000 feet. Uh, this year we're not planning on doing very much. I'm waiting for the video results. We just had some video tape done. So I'm waiting for those to see if there's any major problems. I'm not going to do any this year. So it's kind of one of those wait and see type things. But it is a budget. But we don't always do it because it's kind of expensive. So what happens if you don't do it? Like if you miss something or. We have to that, dig it up and repair it. We, we dig it up and repair it. We don't, we can dig up and put in little sections, 10 feet. We don't like to replace entire blocks. With the lining method, they can do six blocks at one shot for a lot less money than it would take us to replace those six blocks. Six blocks. And they don't have to do anything because they do it all from our manual. So, it's the manhole rehab. If we fix the manhole so that we can get the sewer line, which would put us in a better position. So it all kind of works together. Okay. All our waste ends up in a water resource recovery facility located at the south end of the town by the interstate. As I stated earlier, we can treat up to 1 million gallons a day. In order to accomplish this, the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy Wastewater Division mandates that we have wastewater operator licenses. Like the water system, there are four grades or levels of licensure. Grade one is entry level. Grade two is pumps and operations. Grade three is activated sludge and treatment. And grade four is lab testing and chemical treatment. We are required to have grade three wastewater license to operate our facility. We currently have one grade three and one grade two operators. Our facility treats between 400,000 and 600,000 gallons daily. There are two people that work at the facility to do maintenance and adjust the treatment, and we have very strict limitations on what we discharge. We have have a sample monthly to submit those samples to the EPA and NDEE. -E. However, we do sample weekly and record that data for our process control and submit those results as well. This is some of our discharged water from our treatment plant. And you can see it doesn't look dirty or cloudy at all. Where do you discharge the water? To the Platte River.
At our facility, it undergoes several different kinds of treatment. First, we have mechanical treatment, where all the large items are caught and disposed of. Then we have biological treatment, where all, or, all the organic material is removed. And after that, it is separated into water and sludge. The sludge is pumped into the holding tanks for further biological treatment, and the water is discharged into the flat room. This one. The biggest problem that we have with the facility is that it was built 40 years ago and it runs 24 7. So not only do we have equipment that is worn out, but the structure itself is starting to fail. This is why we have applied for and received some state funding to do some upgrades to the structure. We are still in the planning stages, so I'm not sure how much this will involve. But we are in need of a few modifications to the facility. Some of the upgrades that we are looking at, and we're just looking at these, I don't know which one of these we're actually going to do, is a new influent room. This is where all the wastewater enters to, into the facility. And here it goes through various screening processes. And it's pumped up into the reactors to undergo treatment. We're looking at new blowers. These are what we use to add air to make treatment possible. Right now we have 10 blowers, four of them are always on. Our facility was built with a blower that was very widely used, but now is obsolete. We cannot change the blowers we use until we change the piping that goes to the reactors. And the current blowers don't last very long, one to two years. They are very expensive, and they're very hard to get. About eight months from the time we order it, it will show up. We're also looking at a new UV system. The UV system is one of the disinfection methods that we use to be able to discharge our water. Our current UV system uses about 78 ultraviolet light bulbs. The controls for the system are no longer working and it's obsolete, and parts are no longer available. The UV system is only supposed to be on when we're discharging, but ours is on all the time. This is efficient, inefficient, and very costly. The wastewater operators have a very demanding and difficult job. They have to know something about mechanics, engineering, chemistry, and biology. But as complex as it is, it can be very rewarding to know that you can serve the community and protect the environment at the same time. That's our wastewater facility. So are you guys looking at really just repairing what you have or building a whole new facility? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, which right which now, would be better? Right now I would say we, we're looking at taking parts of that building and putting it in a different building. Um, simply because right now everything is housed in one building and it's too difficult to try and modify it because we'd have to change the whole structure. So we're looking at just taking parts of the pieces of it and putting it in a different structure. What would happen if they built a new, cons new construction but you had to take parts of the old? What would happen to the wastewater while you were in limbo? Nothing. It, it would continue to run through our plant as, as it does right now and they would build an entire structure and once that structure is done and complete, ready to run, they would switch the wastewater into that facility. What what happens to the sludge? I was going to ask that same thing. So the sludge undergoes uh, 40 days worth of treatment, biological treatment, and we have to test it to make sure we have all the organic material out of it. The sludge is more of um, heavy metals, grit, sand, gravel. Believe it or not, there's that's what it is. It's not any organic material. If you go out there, you don't see any flies, or you don't see any rats, you don't see any of that stuff, because there's no organic material. But uh, because our sludge has a high concentration of heavy metals, we have to take it to the landfill to get rid of it. Most other plants are able to apply it to different land management areas, or various issues, haying, or corn plants, or whatever they apply it to. But our sludge, 
we haul we, we treat it and then we haul it to the landfill. With a new system, would you be able to do something different with this? That's one of the questions I'm waiting to figure out. I would hope so, but I, I don't know that to be sure. And then your um, the two guys that are um, certified, do are they out there full time? One is and one isn't. So you have a how many how many people are in the water sewer division, including yourself? Seven. Seven. So one person is out there all the time. Two. Two people are out there all Two the time. Two people are out there all the time. Okay. So, and then you take yourself out of it. So really, you have four people dealing with water and sewer issues all the time in Cozad. Yes. Okay. That ideal. Yes. Right now. Um, ideally, it would be nice to get another person out of the treatment plant because it is a massive amount of work, but it's hard to justify when you get all your work done just to sit there and try to adjust your process controls or um, screw with the sludge holding tanks or you're pressing your sludge into cake. I mean, it, it's hard to justify another person because it'd be difficult to keep them busy for 40 hours a week. However, there are days like the last two weeks we could have used three people out there. And we do that. Sometimes the people in town end up going out there and working out there just because there's so much work to do. There are times that those guys have to come into town and help us when we have water main breaks or sewer breaks that they have to come in and help us as well. So it's not one size fits all. Everybody does everything when everybody needs it. Some of the water and sewer systems, um, at the water department, we have a saying that says, if everything works right, nobody ever knows we were here. What that means to us is that the water and sewer systems are always working behind the scenes, and water is not something that everyone thinks about all the time. Because COZAD is so supportive and forward-thinking, the water department can continue to provide safe and reliable drinking water for years to come. If anyone has any questions or would like to know more about any of these subjects, contact my office. I'd be happy to discuss any of these topics in more detail. Was there an, ever any question with, with uh, Tenneco? I had heard a long time ago that there was some water issues with Tenneco. Did that ever have any impact on the drinking water for the city? Not on the drinking water for the entire city. There were some um, concerns about some contamination. They ended up abandoning a couple of wells, uh, but because the people that were here at that time were so forward-thinking and concerned, it never did amount to a huge problem for the entire city. There were some concerns, but they mitigated those pretty pretty quickly. Did you guys ever have to deal with that then at the sewage tre water treatment plant? Not that specific contamination. Um, every once in a while, we do have some something weird that comes through there, and it, and we can tell. Uh, but it it could be a hundred things. It could be somebody dumps a, a hot tub that's full of chlorine, or if somebody could dump a bunch of bleach down the drain, or somebody puts a whole bunch of antibiotics. And I mean a whole bunch, not a bottle. I mean a whole bunch of antibiotics down there. Our entire treatment process works out of bacteria. So if you dump fill full of bleach or antibiotics, it tends to be a problem. So what would you like the public to not put down sewage drains or bleach and antibiotics? Paint. Antibiotics are the big one. Paint. Everybody, everybody takes antibiotics from time to time, but they are really are a huge problem for us. If you put a pill down or half a bottle, it isn't gonna hurt us. You rinse your spoon off. Right, that isn't going to hurt us, but you pour the I bottle. A thousand people or two thousand people all doing that on a daily basis or weekly basis it becomes a huge problem. So all I would say is please dispose of your medications properly. Um, talk to your pharmacist or, or your doctor on how to dispose of them. Don't dump them down the drain. They create a huge problem for us. Is there anything else you don't want people dumping? Like I said. Uh, don't take bottles of bleach and dump it down there so you can clean out your, your toilets. <laughs> I, like you're don't, me. I, I don't mind a little bit of bleach isn't going to hurt us, but you know, a lot of people have problems with tree roots or whatever in their sewer systems. 
leech isn't going to kill your, your, your tree right now. So don't dump a whole bottle down your drain because that does end up at the treatment plant that chlorine is a disinfectant that kills bacteria and there again causes us a significant issue. So good those are two main good to know. Of, but anything that kills bacteria, I, I, we can't dump it down the drain in large quantities without us having more, more time to get fix the problem. Good to know. Anybody have any questions? Any more questions? Very interesting. Well, I covered a lot of information. And I went pretty quick about it. So really, if you have questions, give me a call. Awesome. Um, I guess the other shout out would be that if you are paying your Board of Public Works bill, you now go to the city office. Oh, yeah. yes, that is correct. Sorry, I forgot. Your office is still in the Board of Public Works. That is correct. But in order to visit with me, you need an appointment. And so you need to, you need call, to call the city office, office to yes. get an appointment. Okay. Is there anything else that has changed that you would like the public to know? Not as far as I am, I know of. So don't dump antibiotics or bleach. And if you're on the odd side of the street, water Tuesday, Tuesday Thursday, Thursday, Saturday. If you're on the even, water Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yes. And I think that's all for good cause. Thank you, Troy, again, for coming. Very interesting.